Through the pages of history, education has taken many forms. From that of the cave paintings with the hunter-gatherers, to that of craft masters passing down knowledge from master to apprentice, all the way until now with teachers and learners in the modern education system. But today I'd like us to consider something different. I'd like us to consider this question. What does education actually look like when knowledge is no longer a scarce resource that needs to be preserved and disseminated? What does education look like when information is openly and freely accessible? And so today I'd like to tell you a story that exemplifies the possibility of what a new form of learning might look like. And it all starts with a story of a young Kenyan couple leaving their home to make a life here in a newly democratic South Africa. Pascal and Betty Olo by name, or more commonly known to me and my brothers as mom and dad, came here to start a new life. Now, there were a couple of things that separated or distinguished us from the people around us, apart from the fact that we were from a different country. You see, my mom was trained as a, as a teacher professionally, but was a stay-at-home mother. But over and above that, my dad also started a business, which he ran from home. So we actually had two stay-at-home parents. And then there was also the fact that it seemed like each of the four boys and my parents had some kind of academic gift, all in different formats. And probably most importantly, because we were able to spend that much time together, my parents were able to instill in our upbringing a culture of thoughtful dialogue. And then, well, then you get me, the artistic one more commonly known as the problem child. And, you know, I can still remember in my earliest days, sort of, as long as it was a topic I was interested in, I was the first one to have my hand up, always wanting to answer questions, kind of just really fully being in the process of learning. But it would turn out that I would have an undiagnosed illness. You see, when I was much younger, I had an extreme, extremely severe allergy to books, <laughs> more commonly known today as dyslexia. And I can remember, you know, really, really early on, around 10 years old, for the very first time, being in the classroom and it actually striking me, the amount of reading that would be required for me to actually access that knowledge that has been pre preserved by humanity over generations would simply increase. And the difficulty to actually engage with that was only going to get harder. And what might have been a speed bump in my learning turned out to be a massive chasm between myself and the content that was made available to me. But more importantly, between myself and the teachers that were actually meant to support me through that process. And this brings us to the first challenge that this new form of learning aims to address. And that is a form of learning that, doesn't, that actually focuses on developing material that is centered around the individual, centered around the learner, rather than simply being a systematic, standardized approach. And so the first idea that this process is founded on is that of a developmental psychologist, Lev Vygotsky. And the idea that he shares is that of the zone of proximal development. And it's, in some ways, it's a very simple idea, but a very, very powerful one. You see, what he tries to do is map out the domain of learning and growth in three domains. You see, the first domain is that of mastered knowledge, the things that we know how to do, those that give us a sense of competence when we're engaging in them. But then there's this much, much larger domain of the things that we don't know how to do yet, the things that require us to step outside of our comfort zone simply even just to make an attempt. But then he speaks about this interesting middle ground. The things that are outside of our current capabilities, but with a little bit of effort, stepping outside of our comfort zone, we can actually learn new things and pick up skills that were previously outside of our capability. And the last important idea that he adds to this map is that of the more knowledgeable other, an individual who is more, more knowledgeable than us in this domain and can actually create a zone space for learning. And by doing so, what they do is they expand the area that is safe to actually explore. And they actually enable the process of learning to happen in a way that it might not be able to do by yourself. 
And this is the first foundational idea that supports a process of self-directed learning. But it also introduces a new challenge. And I can remember for myself this was the case. And I think for the, for the parents in the crowd, you might be familiar with this phenomenon. There is this consistent tension between the things that drive you internally. For me, that was music, videos, video games, all kinds of things that are a distraction to what you're meant to be learning. And then you have all of these things that people tell you that you need to be doing. All of these external influences, these external motivators that are pushing you in a different direction. And especially if that zone of proximal development doesn't fall inside of what you are being presented with, when you have a barrier that doesn't allow you to engage with the learning content, your internal motivation drives you in other directions, in directions that other people might not see, but that are uniquely geared to you. And that introduces us to the second main challenge, being able to leverage intrinsic or internal motivation in service of the process of learning rather than in opposition to it. And so, to combat this, I'd like to introduce an idea explored by Ned Johnson and William Sticksrud, a college test prep coach and a neuropsychologist, respectively. And what they do in their book, The Self-Driven Child, is explore the nature of internal motivation. What actually makes it so that that inner drive can be leveraged towards what we are doing? And so they, they, they explore an, an idea called self-determination theory. And in this theory, there are three core things that support the process of growth from a psychological perspective specifically. The first is a sense of competence, a sense of feeling like maybe you don't have the answer right now, but you are capable of actually getting there. The second is a sense of autonomy, feeling like you are in control of what's around you. And the third is that of a sense of relatedness, feeling like you're connected to the people around you and you belong to some kind of community. But of the three, it is autonomy that is most important specifically to leverage internal motivation. And so what we can actually do as educators, as learners, as managers, what we can aim at doing is putting the decision-making process in the hands of the learner rather than trying to prescribe to them what they should be learning. And by doing that, you start to turn the internal motivation from an obstacle into a driving force. And so with these two ideas, we start to see the, the outlines of what a self-directed system might actually look like leveraging internal motivation, and focusing on the things that are within the capabilities of the individual. And so I can remember at the end of my, my education process, sort of having this, this crossroads of needing to decide what I was going to do. Would I follow what people were saying was the way to a brighter future? You know, give up three to four years, get this piece of paper, which is going to ensure that you get your dream job and live a great life? Or am I going to take another route? the path less trodden, go out into the unknown. And I can remember around my second attempt at second year, doing job shadowing for, for about a month in one of the big banks here. And I got to see what a designer actually did as a job, what they did on a day-to-day -day basis, the skills and the requirements of this kind of profession. And for the first time, I'd seen a path forward that actually leveraged my strengths, that used my ideal form of learning. And so, in the middle of the year, I stopped going to class and I began to watch YouTube videos of professionals who were actually doing what it is that I wanted to do and learning directly from the source and doing so in a way that I was comfortable with. I began to listen to audiobooks, a form that doesn't require that obstacle, and it allowed me to actually enter that zone of proximal development and pick up skills that I was actually interested and driven to use. And so, nearly seven years later, I've been practicing as a designer. But something interesting happened. You see, as I began speaking to colleagues, speaking to people in other companies, I started to see a pattern. You see, back then, I was convinced that it was just me that needed a different path. But more and more, I started to see the same pattern in other people. See other people who were doing jobs that they didn't study for, they weren't trained for but they went off the beaten path to make something of themselves. I expanded that domain. I began to speak to people in the Americas, people from Europe, people right out of university to people who have been in their industry for five decades. And it was the same. But the challenge was, as an individual, I could only speak to one person at a time. 
And this brings us to the third and possibly most important aspect that this self-directed learning aims to address. And that is educating at scale. How can we actually turn something that requires a one-to-one -one relationship into something that is available to the masses? And it all started with an old colleague and now very good friend of mine, Sabiha Banubai. She runs a design agency, and I thought that what if we actually tried to do this in real life with people who actually needed to learn in the context of genuinely making money in a real business? And so we ran this pilot program with her and her team. And really what we were aiming to do is get an understanding of what learning might look like when it is wholly determined by the individual. And so this process had two main foundations. The first is that of the individual, getting to understand what drives them, what they're interested in, what their passions are, but also where their weaknesses are, to be aware of what we should be looking at doing. But then there is also that of the community, the place that they belong, the future of that business, because that business is a part of each person's future. And so we get to understand the vision of, of this organization. What is the world it is trying to bring into being? And then based off of these two pillars, we would have a series of discussions that actually allow them to build for themselves a learning experience, a learning journey based on the content that they are personally invested in. And the interesting thing that I found when going through this process is regardless of where they were, regardless of their role, their responsibilities, the same set of discussions, the same set of ideas allow you to build for yourself a learning journey. But again, there is still the challenge of having a one-to-one -one relationship and requiring scale. And so what we would instead look for is something closer to this, something where the mentorship almost cascades through the organization and can expand. And so I'd like to introduce the third and final idea. Futurist and founder Peter Diamandis and his co-author Stephen Kotler explore the idea of exponential patterns. And these are patterns of human development that have done something very interesting. They allow an individual to leverage the capabilities, the skills, and the things that a huge crowd has available to them. Now, in the context of this book, they speak about the economic impacts. They look at what crowdfunding actually has allowed. It's allowed local and remote global communities to put their resources behind a specific challenge or problem in a way that they might not have been able to do without this technology. They then explore the means of production, the things that we do to actually create economic value. How on-demand 3D printing allows us to do things that would require a full production line. And it's something that can simply be done online on demand. And lastly, they explore that of labor, looking at how crowdsourcing has enabled business people and individuals to leverage the skills and capabilities from all over the world. But if we can do this for the economy, why then can we not do the same for education? What would it look like if we took these three pillars and actually saw how exponential patterns could improve this process? And if we were to look at the education system at the moment, it's basically got three categories. There is a set of material, a curriculum, which is transmitted to a learner through an educator. And this could be a teacher, this could be a mentor, this could be a manager. There are different forms. But in some sense, there are these three consistent ideas. But for the very first time, there have been these interesting technological advancements that have brought the knowledge directly to the individual. And there is no re barrier or requirement for the teacher in between the learner and the information. And so we come back full circle to this question. What should education look like when knowledge is no longer a scarce resource? And I believe, well, I believe then we focus on what the actual learning relationships look like. What might the world be if education was not focused around preserving and disseminating knowledge, but instead in a world where there is so much knowledge available, education might be centered around navigating that knowledge and the relationship between the educator and the learner that actually allows them to absorb that knowledge knowledge defined by their own interests. And so with these three core ideas, I believe that we can do something special. We can do something great. And so I stand here before you with the seeds of a brighter future. 
And I implore you, be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for fallow grounds, for potential yet left unrealized. And if you have the courage, if you have the courage to pick up that mantle of mentorship, I believe together we can rebuild the fabric of society that supports the education system. And in so doing, we can serve the educational requirements of the society today. And maybe, just maybe, we can do so for a society in the future. Thank you.